This episode is dedicated to all of you out there who are the future of filmmaking and screenwriting. Recently, Joe Bob Briggs gave a monologue on his show on Shudder about up and coming filmmakers. And one of the things he touches on is his view on the word aspiring. He says, there is no such thing as an aspiring filmmaker. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. He says that you are a filmmaker. He says, forget aspiring. You are a filmmaker. If you have 10 minutes a day to work on your film, work on it 10 minutes a day. But you are a filmmaker. That monologue had the exact intended impact on me that I think Joe Bob intended for it to have on everybody. It inspired me, it motivated me, and it made me want to continue to get out there and be a filmmaker. And my hope for this episode is that you feel the same thing. I had the privilege to sit down and speak with someone that I consider a film genius. His name is Hilton Ariel Ruiz. He's an independent filmmaker. He's done films such as Zombie with a Shotgun, Clans Rules, And he actually did this really, really amazing five minute and 16 second long short film called Survival. He did it back when he was in film school in 1996. And it is the epitome. It is the standard of what a short film should be. And I highly encourage each and every one of you out there to go to his YouTube page and check that film out. It is amazing. Don't be surprised if you find yourself wanting to grab a pen and paper and take some notes because Hilton provides a lot of nuggets of wisdom on filmmaking and screenwriting. And I think there's something here for every one of you out there, no matter where you're at in your filmmaking and screenwriting career. So without further ado, here is filmmaker Hilton Ariel Ruiz. How you doing, man? Hey, what's up, man? How's everything, man? Thank you for having me on the show, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate you coming on. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a cold day. I know you got some uh, snow and stuff going on in New York right now. Yeah, New York is, oof, today it is freezing and we're around 15 degrees with the wind chill probably like feeling below. You know, it's one of those days when you have the heat on, you're like, is the heat on? <laughs> but oh, the heat goodness. is on. But yeah, it's yeah, one I mean, of those, uh, uh, yeah. You just look forward to your HVAC bills going up. I, I just, Believe it or not, down here in Tennessee, it'll actually get to, um, I've, I, in my lifetime, we, we have had single digit weather before. Um, but it, it tends to hover in the 20s. It's been getting down in the 20s lately, but 15 is rough. I, uh, I thought I knew what cold was until I went to Wisconsin several years ago. And it oh, got down boy. into the single digits. I had no idea what cold was until, <laughs> until I went up there. Yeah, I think I could say the same thing. I don't know what cold is until probably Wisconsin. Yeah. But yeah, New York here is just, uh, you know, we're in January and winter. So, you know, we expect this sort of weather. You know, it's just that whole wind chill just makes it just wow. It's it's interesting, too, though, how how different the country reacts depending on where you're at to snow. So, like, you know, be, be originally being from Nashville and even in Knoxville. If we get an inch of snow, it's it's like the apocalypse is happening and everything just shuts down. You know, like people don't know what to do. You're afraid to walk on the sidewalks, get the salt out there. And then, but yeah. then like when you go up, you go up north, it's just it's it's just another day. People don't even it, it doesn't seem to phase anyone. You guys will get like four feet of snow and it's just nothing. Like you just get out and shovel the driveway and, <laughs> and move on about your day. It's it's really interesting the difference there. That um, is so true. It's, and that's, that's a good segue into our, you know, where, where we'll start, man. Like, so you, you originally are from New York. Correct. I'm originally from New York city. Yes. Um, what, uh, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in lower East side of Manhattan. So it was a pretty interesting, uh, area in lower East side. It was from, uh, it was basically, uh, you can say Chinatown. So the zip code that I was in is just directly in Chinatown, but it's, uh, two blocks off of me. Um, it's a little Italy and then two blocks off to going east. Um, you would say it's like, um, you would have like the real, uh, you know, the heart of lower east side. And then of course you go three blocks north, you know, you're going to house and we're, you know, now you're hitting Soho. So I was really an interesting area in, in Manhattan. And then later on, I, I, years later, I went to moved in Queens. And so I moved, I was back and forth actually from there, moving back to Queens or I'm moving back to Lower East Side because my parents had like two places there where, you know, we moved back and forth. And that was the a great experience, you know, as, as also being a filmmaker, just seeing the, you know, two different sides of, of, you know, New York itself. And, yeah. um, so that was just an, a really just a powerful um, place living. You know, you have he was there and, you know, every day he was there in Chinatown and, you know, just hanging out there and playing in the arcade and checking out the all the cool gadgets and everything. And then you just go walk a couple blocks down. You got a little Italy and then you couple more blocks and then you can go there and, eat, you know, eat some good, you know, Latin food. And that was just it was just, you know, being I, I, I mean, I guess I speak for everybody that, that grew up in New York City. It's just that's just how it is. You're just growing up with every single different type of ethnic group. And just it was just an, an amazing uh, um, experience growing up there. 
Yeah, I, um, that's that's definitely a really cool thing to, to have around you. Um, and, and I imagine that had a, that played a big impact on who you are as a filmmaker today and in the stories you tell. So like you're so let's talk about your parents for a minute. What, what did your parents do or what do they do? I should say. Well, my, my parents, um, they, they own an establishment. Um, we used to run a, uh, a, a beer beverage company out here in, in actually in Lower East Side, Manhattan. Um, so that was one of the things that we were able to, that was one of the reasons why we were located in Lower East Side. So they were here, we was more into distribution. So we were very lucky in, in um, having such a good establishment. And um, that also was helping me for also to be a good filmmaker because it helped me communicate so well with so many, you know, after a while I was just doing exactly what they were doing, you know, just being a, just a true salesman, you know, just going everywhere yeah. and in the five boroughs, was just trying to like make money with, you know, just trying to, uh, build accounts and stuff like that. So that was basically uh, one of the things they did. So, that, so, so it sounds like that really kind of prepared you for the business side of filmmaking, just having to deal with distributors and, and producers and, and secure financing that um, I imagine getting to work in your parents' company in that capacity really prepared you for that part of the, the filmmaking experience. Yeah, absolutely. Abs- absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, it's such a different sort of, um, um, it definitely is different, but there is that, you know, just that sales uh, aspect. And I think it, it comes also helping out as like, you know, you get to used to always, you know, talking to strangers every day. Right. And it's a lot of times filmmaking is just when you build a crew and everything like that, you, you build a team of just a bunch of strangers and you just get to so like know how to communicate with those people. Just first time meeting them and feeling the vibes and just even by looking at their face. There, you just know exactly who the person is by just just a walk into a room. You can just sort of kind of figure it out who the person is. You know, it's just that's that's what helped me out a lot of just preparing for that and the business aspect as well. You know, just um, you know, and I think that that I think that's why I stayed so much as an indie filmmaker because I'm always trying to know like, wait a minute, this guy's trying to rob me. You know, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna go to this distribution to try to steal my film and all that stuff. So. <laughs> that helped me, and I think that's kept me really true to indie filmmaking, where, you know, I always wanted to keep my own stuff to own my own IP, um, as a, and, and that is the amazing thing, is not a lot of filmmakers can say this, uh, I own all my IP, um, so that that's just, uh, that is a very big thing in indie yeah. filmmaking, you know, a lot of people just, you know, get their stuff away, and again, I think if you go back what you're saying about that prepare me, I think, yes, it did prepare me. Um, because, and that of just trying to not give my IP away. And so many times there was just always a discussion of people just wanting my film to say, Hey, you know, sign it over here and whatever and everything. I'm like, no, it just doesn't make no sense. A lot of times I held on to my film because I'm like, no, I'd rather just keep it. Why, you know, I'm going to give something perpetual forever to give to somebody that's just going to make so much money for years and years, generation for years and years. And I've always like pulled, uh, pulled away from such like deals that even like i said uh um like you said even what you said it did help me um uh, me growing in the business of just knowing what's uh what deals were wrong to make and what deals not to make so that yeah. is uh definitely a, was a key well because i mean as as a filmmaker man i think it's like equal parts psychology equal parts businessman i you know actually it's, it's interesting you, you talk about that because i i recently heard uh an interview with john carpenter And he was talking about being a director and he said one of the key, one of the keys to being a good director is you have to be able to be what it is your actors need. But I think it was in the context of of psychology. You know, he said, like, if I had an actor that needed a father figure, I could be a father figure to them. I'd be their dad. If I have an actor that needs a, a mean, overbearing micromanager, I can be a micromanager to them. Um. So it's 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 re- it's re- interesting you talk about that because I, I think that's probably one of the the biggest challenges and maybe even the biggest thing about being a director is in a way you also have to be sort of a psychologist you know you have to be able to read people you have to you have to be able to um, meet your actors where they are because at the end of the day that project is them and filmmaking ultimately is people absolutely and and they're and you know actors are artists you know we artists are very like you know needy and very like you know more dramatic than other people <laughs> so you know me being an artist I, I know how that is you know just having meeting people on the set just like okay you know this person's kind of just like me i understand them so you know it's a it's a definitely you know it, you always have somebody in the set that you just needs more attention than others and you just gotta like you said it's a, it is exactly what that is you know just and i think that's just the key of just you know 
of being a director slash filmmaker is just going there and just uh, uh, knowing who the who the actors you're working with, who they are, and what you know troubles that they're going through in in life, and just try to just be there for them. Um, and and it's just it's like a mind game sort of thing, you know. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, does it work? Yeah, it works. It, 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 there's there's some 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 that don't necessarily work all the time. You just got to deal with it. You know, I'm like, oh man, this is just not gonna work. You know, just you got to get somebody else to communicate with the person. But that's just part of filmmaking. It's, you know, that's just the part about that's the that's the you know you, you roll with the punches. Well, and and I think I think the reason as artists we are that way. Um, and actually, I was listening to uh, Mick Garris talk to Tom Savini last night um, on the uh, the Postmortem podcast. And I was really inspired what Tom Savini said, because Mick Garris asked him, out of, out of all the things you do, like, what is it that you love the most? And Tom basically said it's it's creating. And he tells that to his students. Um, he loves being able to create things, you know, and he tells the students that, you know, Everything you do didn't exist before you did it. You gave life to this idea. You are creating things. And I think that's why as artists, we might be seen as, you know, dramatic or because in a way, man, we're dealing with these ideas are our children. They're our dreams. You're taking imagination, you're taking dreams and you're making them reality. You're giving them life. And that, and, and that's a serious thing. You know, that's something we hold sacred. I mean, this is something that we we've poured our heart and our soul into this is our baby you know like we want it we want the best for it you know absolutely man it's just it's 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 so true i mean you know like uh it's just you know you have these ideas and these these sort of um you know like you said these babies these oh this is my baby you want to treat it very well and everything like that and and you know you're very sensitive to it and everything like that so it means a lot more and i guess you know when people go out there and you know, and work on their craft, that craft to them, it means so much to them that, you know, they become more, you know, sensitive than, than, you know, other, you know, than other aspects in their life, because that's what that, that craft means so much to them. Yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you this. What was the first horror film you recall seeing? And like, what, what impact did that have on you? Mm, that's a good question. I can't remember what's the first horror film, but I would say that, you know, Oh my God, that's a good damn question. I think maybe the first horror film. Oh man, maybe it could be The Omen. If that I could recall going back, possibly like The Omen. Um, wow, yeah, um, yeah. Cause I used to go to the theater every weekend uh, with the family. Every weekend we went to the movie theater. Um, it was the cheapest, uh, you know, taking the kids out. You know what I mean? I I mm-hmm. grew up. Um, I always tell everybody I grew up in the, you know, like in the Latin Brady Bunch, you know, I really did. I had three boys in the household, three girls in the household. We had mom and dad. And then we had my aunt that was like Alice from, you know, from Brady Bunch. Instead of the, the dog, we had a cat and I was the youngest one. So just imagine taking six kids and, you know, what do you do with six kids in the house? Yeah, right. take them to the movie theater to shut them up, right? That's basically one more way to do it. You, know, they go, you go crazy in the house, you know. I, 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 I so much, you know, respect my parents, especially my aunt who, who took care of us. I, I knew she went crazy. Years went by, I was like, damn, she went crazy with all. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we went to the movies every weekend, and we would, like, sneak sometimes, like, to two or three other movies after that, you know. But, um, I mean, we saw all the Friday the 13th and, Hall- you know, Halloween's from – you know, I would say we didn't see the Halloweens in the, in the theater. We saw it at home. But I mean, the one that really um, stuck out with me the most, I would have to say Halloween, too. If and now that I start to really, really think about what really made me, I think Halloween, too, made the biggest impact on me. My, my, and just a first horror film, first horror experience, first horror fear and scared impact definitely with Halloween, too. What what would you say it was about it that really had such an impact on you? It's just the, the you know me being a little kid watching him. Why was this man going after this woman? You know what was going on? Here? I was I was so scared. It was frightening, and uh, I still remember to this day watching it at home. I was hiding behind the fridge, watching the scene where Michael Myers pops up uh, behind the car. When Dr. Loomis and the, the officer and, and, and I guess the lady who worked for the state goes into Haddonfield Hospital 
and then the door closes and then she does that scream and then Mike Myers comes slowly creeping after her and she's just walking to that door. That I can still remember me hiding behind the refrigerator, like really like crapping in my pants, looking at that scene. I would never forget it. Um, it's just, and to this day, I watch that scene and it's still a freaking kick ass scene. Um, and I do remember that. That that was probably my first like fear, like moment, like, oh my God. What film would you say really bit you with the filmmaking bug? Like at what point in your life would you say you really realized? Actually, let me, let me back up. One, one of the things I want to ask you, so as children, we all have that thing we want to be when we grow up. Like, what, what is it you wanted to be when you grew up? Uh, besides the filmmaker? Yeah. I wanted to be an athlete. <laughs> okay. What sport? Yeah. The baseball. Baseball. Okay. So yeah. you're still big, are you still a big baseball fan? No, I'm not. It's just so weird. <laughs> really? Well, I'm a big New York Yankee fan. Um, but as a um, baseball fan, like, I love the sport, but I don't watch it. You know what I mean? And it has nothing to do with like, I hate the sport or, or and politics or anything like that. I just don't have time. You know what I mean? I just don't have time to watch, watch, you know, three hours, four hours a game. You know, I just do not. Um, I rather do watch a football game. You know, it, it's just, um, it's just such more quicker and everything. And then after, after the game, you're pumped. After the baseball game, you feel like you want, you know, like you want, you're like in this relaxed mode. You know, people's gonna say it's boring. Yeah, every, 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 you know, to each is their own. People think sport. You know, I don't think baseball is boring at all. But it does give you this, you know, this element of relaxation of watching a ball game. You know, so when you watch a ball game and after that ninth innings, you're still in this sort of relaxed mode. You know, like, oh, this is really cool. Let me go get a drink, blah, blah, blah. Football, you pump. In the last game, you know what? Let's go out. Let's go do this. this. So I love that sort of like still up, waking up, watching a football game. <clears throat> I feel like that in basketball, too. Basketball, to me, gets a little bit boring going back and forth, you know, going back and forth thing. But, uh, yeah, baseball was 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 the sport that, I, you know, I, I watched all the games. I used to love it and everything, but not into it anymore. Is that, and when I say not into it as much, I don't watch the game anymore. I only in playoffs. Do you still play at all? Uh, no, I do not. I do not. I know it's so weird, you know, and I, and I talked about that with, <clears throat> with, with a, with a friend from mine not too long ago. It's like how I was so into like sports when I was so young and just like, now it's like when somebody meets me, they're like, who are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, uh, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, that's just the way of life, you know, I mean, I, you know, just people, cause people do, you know, change and everything like that. And, and again, I, I don't get me wrong. I love the sport of baseball. I love it, but it's just, I just don't have, I'm not in it like that anymore. Yeah. Not totally understand. It's just, that's just part of, you know, I'm, 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 I'm getting close to 40 and it's, it's, it's been strange to look back over the past, you know, just even hitting 30 over the past six years. Um, how much things have changed. Like I got bifocals this year. <laughs> That was, oh, that was probably, the, that was probably the most humbling thing to happen to me this past year, man. I, I literally, my birthday's in October, this, the month of October, I got my, <laughs> and I knew it was going to happen. Uh, yeah. You know, having, having stared at screens my entire life working in IT, I knew it was time. Cause I, you know, people started showing me things on their phones and I would take the phone and like hold it away from me. And I'm thinking, oh boy, it, it's, it's happening. Presbyopia is setting in. So it's, I mean, it, it makes sense as we get older, our priorities change and, and even. Our yeah, change. yeah. I mean, but something, you know, the, but a lot of people don't, a lot of, you know, friends, friends that still been watching sports are still the fanatics and that I went to school with and everything. And I sometimes just don't get it, but they look at me and they don't get what I'm, you know, about me. So it's, that's okay. So, so going, going back to, um, to Halloween two. When was it you knew that you wanted to become a filmmaker? How, how, do you remember how old you were? You know, it's that's a very cool, interesting story you tell you, you talk about because let's go back to my household, right? So when again I grew up in this whole Latin Brady bunch, you know, that is I'm you know, my background, I am Latin. So and and um we used to go to these you know, to the movie theaters every weekend and everything. And every day, every time. So remember, we had three boys and we had three girls. So everyone sort of like split the girls do their thing. And the guys would do the thing when we would go home. Right. So every movie that we would watch, we would go back home and reenact the best scene in the film. So like <clears throat> we watch Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi as an example I'm going to give you. So as I was the youngest one in the family, of course, I'm the youngest one out of the three boys. And so my... So my brother 
and my cousin because my cousins grew up with me so we have my brother and my cousin like they were one would be luke skywalker and the other one would be dark raider and i was the young kid that was like hey what about me i want to be like you know can i be one of the characters can i be you know i want to be dark Raider. i want to be luke skywalker and they were like no you can't because you know the little kid is annoying they don't want the little kid to you know play so they would say okay we got a position for you. We, we, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be the cameraman. And you're going to, they made a box for me. And I would have this box and I'll pretend I'm the camera guy. Cause they call the camera guy. They didn't, they didn't call the director the filming. But after a while, as, as time would go by, they're like, all right, direct this over here. So that was a pretty beginning, like a, a, a pre sort of like me being a filmmaker, but never had that dream when I was a little kid. But it was just so funny. It was, it, 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 it was building up. So I would be this guy, like we watch a lot of these Kung Fu movies also, portray them, and I'd be like, all right, I got the camera here. All right, so I'll be going around the camp with them and everything, like a fake like director, you know, going around them. Years went by, you know, we got a, we got a, 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 a you know, whatever, VHS, uh, um, those huge big camcorders, and then I oh, started, yeah. pl- started playing yeah. with it. And then we started making like sort of like all little home movies. And then I was like maybe like 13 or 14. My mom surprised me with the, like my first like uh, high eight, you know, uh, a camera. Um, and I was like my birthday gift. I was like, holy shit. And then I just started making movies with my friends. But I still didn't have like sort of like, oh, I want to be a filmmaker. You know what I mean? You know, I was just like love making these, thin movie, you know, these homemade movies and everything. And you know, I just had I had such a. Um, uh, a pretty awesome childhood, you know, again, growing up in Manhattan, growing up in the city, growing up in Queens, going, just going everywhere was just an amazing experience. I had all these friends, all this thing. We did, we just, I just had a blast when I was in my young years. And so that thing, whenever it came, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I just used to make these little, small little film projects. And it was just when I entered in high school, um, it was just a very coincidence um, thing and that they had put you know how high school they put you into a program these are the classes you have to take you got to shut up and you can't say anything you know what i mean right this yeah. is the class you can take you're gonna take wood shop i don't want a wood shop i don't care you take a wood shop guess where they put me into cinema studies no kidding yes i got stuck with cinema studies for my high school and i didn't complain and that was the first opening my eyes saying this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It opened up. Um, God bless Miss Wilson. She was the teacher. She, she's the one who basically uh, opened my eyes and said, oh, man, I want to be a filmmaker. She was the best. She was great. She made she forced us watching all these classic films and we watched it and, and we dissect the films. What was it about? What was the symbolic of the of this scene? What was the and I was like, holy shit, man, this is what I want to do. And since then. From high school, that's what I always wanted to do. Now, did you did you have the traditional uh, path to becoming a filmmaker? Like, did you actually go to film school and, and have formal training? <clears throat> I did. <clears throat> uh, so I'll tell you a little. You want if you want me to go a little bit quick, a, a two minute breakdown of how I did. I'll let you know. But you can ask me sure. question though. Yeah. Um, so after after high school, <clears throat> learning about cinema studies, I did actually wanted to learn more about filmmaking, but I didn't want to take courses right away. So I did, I went into New York Film Academy. I did the, the, the beginners and I took the advance. And from there, I felt like I wanted to learn more about the, the behind the camera. So I went to photography, believe it or not. And I was still making films because I knew how to make films, um, you know, films that I liked, of course. And I studied photography, black and white, in a slash fine arts it was more of a street photography kind of work and um and i was taught by the great jules allen who was sort of became my mentor as after a while uh, learning black and white photography learning about it and you know photography and filmmaking sort of the same sort of concept of course one is a single one is the continuing motion right Mm -hmm. and i think the photography actually helped me become a better filmmaker um, you know, you you basically learn about the whole lighting and, and, you know, of all, you know, working with a light meter. No one works with light meters anymore, right? I was working with the whole light meter and everything, the whole photography, and the dark room and everything, and just learning about the, 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 
the subject matter that's in front of you. You know, either it's a person or either it's, you know, landscape and everything like that. And just learning more about that just made me understand a lot more about filmmaking. And my photography teacher knew I was so into filmmaking. He taught me, you know, so much about it. And uh, a great professor, a great, you know, he's, you know, many books he's come out with. And he actually told me when I was taking school, he said, I don't, I think you should just go back into uh, filmmaking because you, you have it in you. It's just that's what you have. He says, you know, you, you have all in that stuff. So I went back into filmmaking. I went into, I, I con- went to continuing studies in NYU to learn filmmaking. And when I went there, I realized that everything that I've learned from there, and then I went to FIT to learn fashion photography. Believe it or not, I went back and I wanted to learn commercialized photography. Again, another element that I learned about um, filmmaking, stuff like that. But I started to realize that everything started to be redundant in these classes of sort of like, this is how you filmmaking and everything and all that stuff. I said, okay, I learned. And it's just so funny. I took many courses and I didn't realize that the New York Film Academy in those five months of courses that I, that five months of filmmaking, and it's intensive, believe it or not. A lot of people don't realize this. The New York Film Academy is very intensive. It's like nine in the morning to like 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you make your film, right? This we're talking about five months. And those five months, I actually learned everything that I had to learn about filmmaking. But me thinking that the whole idea of you have to go to college, you have to learn this way that, started realizing this is such a fucking waste of time what the fuck am i doing i already learned everything and it just was repetitive it was redundant and all that stuff and again now <laughs> you don't even have to go to film school right and um you know i sort of like said okay you know i became a dropout basically you know i'm like i'm not gonna i did everything that i need to do the only thing i needed to do is just take my uh you know liberal arts classes and everything but i just realized that i already knew what i had to do and also at the same time i i you know, kind of like took over my establishment and there I go, was juggling my establishment, with my filmmaking and everything like that, you know, my, my real job that make the bread and butter and everything like that. So it was an interesting kind of ride in the, in the whole filmmaking of schooling and everything. That's basically my whole learning of like my education of filmmaking, you know, and I did also other courses, stuff. I, w- I want to learn other things also besides filmmaking. That's probably another podcast of other stuff that I took. But yeah, I, I, I did learn the old fashion sort of like this is how you do filmmaking and 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 then you know and then i also learned the whole street photography to the commercialized photography and everything so all those elements became very useful in my filmmaking um you know career as i am right now but as in somebody who wants to do filmmaking i tell them no i don't think you have to t- do all that stuff. you just right now with these phones and everything you can just do your own film where where does film school fit into the timeline with uh, your short film survival Say it again. Where where do, where does uh so you you did the short film survival in 1996. Were were you in film school at that time? Yes, I was. Yes, okay, I was. For, for any of the audience that has not seen Survival, it's it's on his his YouTube page. It is phenomenal. It's it's a it's a it was 16 millimeter, correct? Correct. It's it's a 16 millimeter black and white film done in 1996, and it's. It's like watching a silent film. It, it has, it, it's, I know there's some sound in it, but I, I walked away from it feeling like I watched a really good silent film. Well, so, so one, one of the things, and you and I had talked about this off air, and, and actually I kind of want to expound on something you, you talked about taking photography. One of the things in watching your work, you are an extremely gifted cinematographer. I mean, you are, a, I mean, even, even something you did in film school, the way you did lighting, I mean, black and white's not easy to, to do either in photography or mm-hmm. film. That's the ultimate challenge doing black and white. And, and you know, what's interesting too, is even like when I watch scenes in zombie with a shotgun, I I've always, I'm really blown away by what you do with light. Like you're able to shoot something in color, but you still use light and shadow like you would if you were filming a black and white. Do you think photography is, is what made you such a gifted cinema? Like when you approach framing shots and, and, and designing scenes. Do you approach it like you're taking a photograph and go from there? Yeah. Like my earlier work, like for example, with a shotgun, I definitely had help with these with cinema photographers, two cinema photographers that came on board and definitely there was a look that we really wanted to go with. We wanted to go with a nor feel uh, look to it. And that, that had to do a lot with the camera that we chose for the film. Um, you know, so we decided, okay, we're going to do a North kind of look. And again, like the two photographers that I had with me were very gifted and they helped a lot on that. 
And yeah, there was a lot of discussion of how the shot's going to look and everything, but I definitely wanted that whole noir style in Zombie with a Shotgun. And my earlier works, absolutely, in the film, in the black and white, yeah, I, that's, you know, this, you set up the frame and everything like that. And I think that that um, photography did help um, <clears throat> a lot on my earlier works. And, you know, even going with <clears throat> a lot of stuff in 666 also, you know, framing some of the stuff there and also working with other cinematographers. And I think it did help a lot. Um, and I, I think that um, the black and white to me, yes, I love it. It's just something that I really would love to go back to. Um, to shoot in black and white, you know, but there's this whole thing like, you know, I, and the whole thing that they would say, hey, you just you could just shoot the film and convert it into black and white. I just don't think it's a thing's a little bit. It's different not the same. That. It's not the same. And and yeah, I would love to go back and to shoot that, you know, just the way that I used to do when I used to, when I did my earlier black and white projects. Was was survival. Would you say survival was your first film? I think my first full complete film yes i mean i've done a lot of like other shorts that were like eh, you know silent films everything the other stuff but that was like my first like est- establishing kind of like this is my film this is who i am this is my first yes i would say it and uh, well, it still holds as one of my best works believe it or not I'm, I'm really proud even to say that you know even after all those years it's just uh um and i think it has to do with a you know shot in, shot in the old-fashioned 16 millimeter right and, you know i love that film how, how did you, what was the editing process like for that? Like getting to work with 16 millimeter, it almost looks like it has a, uh, like a filter put over it to give it like that kind of grainy mm. old aged film look. Is that something you did back in 1996 or has that been something you did recently? Like how, how did you edit that film? No, it's, it's just the way it was. So, you know, back then shooting that on 16 millimeter, you know, you, you believe it or not, a lot of that stuff also looks like that also is because the, 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 la- the final product actually, was um it was the actual film we're using on so <clears throat> it wasn't a it, it's the actual print it wasn't even converted to a negative you know it wasn't even converted where the cut was converted from the negative to see the final product what you're seeing in that is actually the work print that's worked on with the splices that were cut on the 16 millimeter steenbeck editing machine so that's why you get to see that sort of like, and it, after years, th- th- having it to work mainly cut on the, the work print, you know, you're not really, you know, the, your final product is not your work print, you know what I mean? So, so that's why you see that sort of like old school scratches and you see the, the you could see the cuts from the splices. You could actually see it. If you slow it down, you can see the, the tape that's still on it, the 16 millimeter, you know, mag tape that's still putting the cuts together and even the sound was was you know it's a you know 60 millimeter mag that's worked on <laughs> on the original work a uh, print um, and that's why you get to see that sort of look and again as years went by that look um confuses people because a lot of people say to me oh what did you use what kind of plug in use what kind of filter you use i was like now dude it's what you see is what you get it's exactly it's, how it's it natural looks. that's that's yeah. amazing that's because yeah. i want I it's no that. no thought, no bbl on it <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool i i, I when i watched that I, I i literally thought i didn't think it was a filter well let me yeah. back up Good. When, when, when I did watch it, it, it looked like it had been shot in the, the mid 90s. I, I thought this looks like it was shot back in the mid 90s. But the man, like it, it is so that's I'm kind of speechless because it really looks like some kind of applied filter. But that's the actual that's the actual I don't know the right word to use patina or like you said, you know, the, the work part. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. First of all, you're, it's for you to carry a camera to shoot in the subways, it's just nearly impossible. Even back then, we've gotten we had gotten stopped by police and the MTA. Um, but if, even now, oh my God, you would have all the people like go crazy because you, you can't do that anymore. You know, can't shoot in subways, you can't do anything. You know, especially with the camera we were holding. I mean, you could do the phone, but still not the same. You know, we had a guy running and freaking with a gun in the subway. I mean, I mean, we were crazy to do that. Um, <clears throat> do that now, you might just you might get shot. You know, <laughs> so it was just it was just a you know very you know um, it was just uh, uh, let's do it, guys. Let's just shoot it, and everybody was gung ho about it, and it was just amazing that you know we you have a team that's willing to do that, and uh, um, yeah, I I I I thought it was uh um, now I think back at it, I'm like that we 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 were crazy when we did it, but 
that's that's a lot of times filmmaking is you got to be crazy <laughs> that's 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 true that's true because i mean there's just there's just so much risk involved i mean like i mean and literally quite literally like i mean you're, you're risking your life in some of the filming locations and things that you can yeah you can yeah and, and we it actually was two different um train stations we shot not a lot of people even know that it was just that we you know what we did was this um <coughs> pretty cool even when he runs down the stairs is run to a different location and actually that was a manhattan location right on lafayette and then the other station was in brooklyn so that was a uh, yeah that was cool do you do you think there are any benefits to to working with film versus i mean i guess i guess you know everything being digital today i i i, I imagine the editing process is, is a lot easier you know I mean, you can do you can use after effects and things like that but i mean w- w- would you say there, were, there was anything uh i don't want to i'm trying to think of the right way to ask this was there anything more beneficial with working with film compared to working with digital i think there is i mean look you know i don't want to be that guy that's gonna say i don't want to be like you know get off of my lawn kind of guy like film is better than, than, than digital you know what i mean i think you got benefits for both of them um, and I think, you know, the, probably the, you know, the benefit of shooting in film is getting it right. You know, you, what kind of ratio you have, you know, shooting and a lot of uh, indie filmmakers, you know, we're going three to one ratio when you're shooting in film because you don't want to spend so much money. It's so much, you know, you know, even like, you know, 16, 35. I mean, I still remember it's like what, even back then, 16 millimeter, 400 foot rolls was 12 minutes around. But remember, you have to burn the first, you know, whatever kind of feed in the, because it gets exposed. So you basically have like 10 minutes, basically. And you're talking about $100 uh, averagely around the row. And then you got to, you know, get that printed, which is another $100. So you're basically saying $200 for 10 minutes. OK, that's crazy, right? And the phone, you know, how much we, <laughs> you can just keep on shooting. So right. let's say you want to do a short film, five minutes. Like, damn. I can't really do it with one roll. You got to get two rolls. So basically, it's running around four hundred, four hundred fifty dollars tax and everything like that. So then you have to make sure that you, when you, when you writing your script and you writing your shot list, you got to make sure that it has to be okay. We're gonna have to shoot three to one ratio because we're we gonna run out of film. So you gotta, you know, make sure how much time you have. Sometimes you only got one shot. This is it. One take. That's it. We can't do anything. So you have to like really, you know, like practice and. You know, you have to get your actors, let's get it ready, get it right. You know, you keep on doing your whole, like, you know, rehearsal, rehearsal. I mean, and then you just know that you can't go back and look at what you shot, you know, unless you, you know, later, you know, you can on, 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 you know, later on, you know, you, you know, you could connect whatever your monitors and stuff like that with, with, the, with the films and you could still see what you take. But as an indie, indie film, you don't have that kind of money. So you yeah, got the spot. Three, you can't do dailies and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can, you know, three and one. Even like if you're in a location that doesn't have like too much, you know, too much electricity, you got to charge all stuff. You can't really do it. But so you say, you know, you do three to one ratio, and then that's how it was. I was shooting, and there's go one and two, and then you have to look at yourself and you say, uh, yeah, that was it. That was it. You know, you have to get that eye, and then you look in the camera at the end. You like when you say when you look at the dailies, like oh god, I hope I got the shot. I hope I got the shot. You know. So and then I think. Getting that, you know, you, you, you rehearse, you get in really tight and knowing that your actors know that we got to get this right. There's a different sort of concentration there. There's a sort of different sort of like feeling and vibe during every take compare to shooting in digital. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this this way and then we'll shoot another way this way. And then if that doesn't work, we'll shoot another way this you know what i'm saying so Mm -hmm. there is a different mood and feel on the set versus that obviously if you're gonna shoot a film you got millions and millions of dollars you can shoot whatever but even that gets expensive you know studios don't a lot of times studios don't want to work because the film is expensive you know the process is crazy you know so that to me i think was you know a big difference there's, there's, so I mean, it really sounds like there's a lot more risk. Like, so, like, so shooting a short film like Survival, uh, on film, it, it was, it was what, 16 minutes, if I recall correctly. No, um, no, it's like six minutes. Six minutes. That's, I'm sorry. And I shot okay. it with three rolls of film. I thought, no, wait, 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 no, 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 two rolls. It, okay, 
Let me just get this straight. Damn, it's been a year. It was 100 foot spools I was shooting with, and I think it was like a basically 12 spools of 100 feet film. I still remember it was a um, 7222 Kodak. That was exactly film stock. I used 7222. So if you got those film geeks that are listening, they know exactly which film stock I'm talking about. And <clears throat> I used it for that. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that was, um, um, yeah, that was 12 spools. So it comes out to two rolls, basically like two rolls and a half of 400 foot rolls. So you're saying 10, 20, like 20, 22 minutes worth of uh, film I shot to make six minutes. Wow. And, and, and like in terms of the number of days, like so so to, to shoot a six minute short film back then on film, like would that be like a week of shooting? Like how long did it take to do that? Uh, three days. That was three days. That was three days. Wait, we it had three to, days. We had to because the reason why we had to do three days in that is because everyone had to take a, a weekend to shoot uh, the film so we can get it processed in. We had to get the film in. I think it was. Uh, I think it was a Sunday. Let me see if I remember. Sunday or Monday morning, we had there was a, um, a pharmacy by NYU that developed this stuff. It was funny. It was in a pharmacy, and you you dropped off your film, and then the next day they would have it for you. So you had to get it in. So you could, you had so you had to get it in before that <clears throat> before the week started or that starting Monday because your job was to edit that week after class. So like I said, you had a nine to five class and then you had to go edit. It was very, 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 um, you know, um, uh, intense course that I was taking. And so, yeah, you edited in the 16 millimeter and everything. So we had to, so I started on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we, 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 we ended the, the, the whole um, production. I, I pre- and, and I'm sorry to focus so much on this. Uh, survival. No, that's okay. I, I appreciate you being able to talk about it because that's, that's a story you, I, I envy you got to live in a really special time in, in independent filmmaking and you got to go to film school in a very special time. And the, and that's a story that eventually is going to dis like nobody's going to be able to tell that story. In fact, I mean, really now, no, what, nobody can tell that story, you know, in, in, in my generation and, and up. Um, and so it, it, I, I appreciate you being able to talk about it because I feel like that's a story that needs to be told. I mean, you, you got to live a, a piece of history. You got to do something that not many people get to do anymore. Um, and I, that's getting to work with film and getting to 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 have, you know, to, to take the risk in filmmaking like that. And so I, I would venture to say there was no such thing as a no budget film back then. Like there there was a cost no matter what you did because you had to have the camera. There was you had a cost. To have the film. And that, and that, yeah, that's interesting. that's really you just pointed out something really damn good, because right now, if you have your phone. And you can get these editing programs that comes with your phone. You don't have to really spend anything. And then there is always a cost. And like I said, like the film geeks, film nerds know that if you was going to shoot a 16 millimeter, that roll of film was averaging $100 in the mid 90s. And then, you know, of course, it goes up. And I think, you know, it's in. And it depends. I mean, sometimes like $110, $112, it was, it was around there. And then you had to figure out where you're going to get a process you know and they, you had like you had magno you had duar you had all these places in new york city that was really really famous for you know what, what the stuff they would do and they process your films and stuff like that and again that's another hundred hundred fifteen dollars so you, you had to spend money you know one roll of film a 400 foot roll you expect to spend 250 dollars from buying it and processing it and then you have to find out where you're going to edit, right? 60 millimeter. No one had steam backs, you know. I actually owned my steam back after years. So <clears throat> then you have to rent some places to find steam back. And then, you know, wasn't that really that expensive to find steam back place to rent, to, to rent? And then, of course, you know, digital came, Avid came and, you know, started taking the game slowly but shortly into a whole different sort of world. And, and it's and, and I, in a way, I feel like it's, you know, hearing that story, I almost feel like digital is good and bad. I, it's good in that it really opens up, it, it opens up the door for anybody that wants to be a filmmaker to become a filmmaker. You know, anybody can take a shot at it. But I almost wonder if that, if if the the downside to it is, you know, it, like like you know we talked about off air. You know, I, I'm in the process of of, of trying mm-hmm. to make a film. You know, I want to become a filmmaker. I mm-hmm. don't know if I can ever appreciate film as much as you, because I've never gotten to have the experience of of having to pour so much of myself into working with, with film, that medium and, and the risk involved there and the cost involved there. 
you know, it, it's, it's, I, I don't know if, if, if modern filmmakers today can really truly appreciate it. Like you can, um, because we, we haven't had like, I, I, in fact, I, I, it really inspires me to want to do a project with, I, I, I kind of want to anyway, but I think at some point it's going to be on my filmmaking bucket list. You know, if, if, if Absolutely. I can really get into filmmaking, I want to do a project in black and white and in film. I want to be able to yeah. have that perspective. Yeah. You know, look, <clears throat> I, I mean, look, you, there's a different type of appreciation that everybody has, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have that sort of same appreciation, you know, because obviously, obviously you, <clears throat> we do not, we're not, no one's shooting film, no one's buying film anymore. I mean, they still have filmmakers out there <clears throat> and, you know, God bless to the Eastern Europeans out in, in Europe. They, they are the ones that's keeping like filmmaking, real filmmaking alive by them still shooting in film, them still taking photographs in film. You know, they really have this sort of like appreciation for it and respect for it. And they're the ones that's keeping it sort of kind of alive and everything like that. And it is expensive. That's, that's one of the main things about the the whole thing about it yeah again yeah I, I i me also doing the photography you know it, i mean all it just putting your hands into the chemicals and smelling that dark room is like no the smell when you smell those chemicals you know if you're in a dark room same thing with mm-hmm. filmmaking when you pop that can of film there's that unique smell and like nerd filmmakers know it like especially if you're going to, in the dark room and you you, you have to you know <clears throat> put the film into the you have to put it into the spool and everything like that put the film inside there's that unique smell of it that i missed a lot but I mean, you know, I think it would be cool. Like if you do your film, like, you know, one day just say, hey, look, let's just buy, uh, let's buy, or, you know, you, they even have like, um, you know, what they call it, I'm starting to get old now, like the, uh, you know, split ends, you know, film that people haven't used, and they sell for like a fraction of price. I'm not sure they still have that. I'm pretty sure they do, but, you know, you have to look for it online and everything like split ends, like people who shot film, but they didn't use this they only use like a hundred feet compared to like the thousand feet and they still enough, you know, to use and everything. And it comes out pretty cheap mm-hmm. and they have stuff like that. And you just get somebody that, you know, has a camera that wants to shoot it. You know, that's another hard thing trying to find who has a camera as well and just, you know, use it and shoot it and everything like that. But you could always hire people too. They have That's true. <clears throat> that's true. I, I, but, I, but I also think there's a good chance of it maybe making re- like I count myself fortunate to be old enough to have gotten to go to the theater and watch an actual film that was on film to, to see the scratches in the film, to hear the cracks and the pops. It was done in stereo. I, I miss that. And that's one of the things I love about Quentin Tarantino. Actually, he's, uh, he, he has an appreciation for film. Like I think it was hateful eight. He did. He was talking to Eli Roth and, you know, cause he shot it. I, 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 he shot it on, was it, I, um, I forget what the, the, it was like 72 millimeter or something like that. And, um, and he Which did film? a showing uh, hateful eight. Yes. Yes. The one yeah, he did shot like 70 millimeter. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so he, he had a, he had a conversation with Eli Roth and they were talking about just, just a love of, of, you know, actual film and the, the type of film he used actually has silver in it. And, and it was, yes, I, I, I think, I think the youth of today, and I don't know, even in my generation, there's, there's a love for vintage. There's a love for retro, you know, you, you see vinyl coming back and, and I, and I think people really do appreciate I don't know. I think it's a good time to maybe see a resurgence of film, you know, and, and maybe, and maybe we'll start to see more of that here in the next 10 or so years. I mean, cause I mean, the movie industry is changing, you know, especially with COVID. I mean, th- there's a chance theaters might die. And and if theaters do die, I think we'll actually start to see more art house theaters pop up because I just don't see film staying in the, yeah, it's convenient to, to have films, you know, really simultaneously in theater and at home. It's like, Oh, I don't have to go anywhere. I can just rent it on HBO max and, you know, and go from there. But, but, but I think, I think eventually there's going to come a point where people miss the theater experience. And we might actually start seeing more independent art house film uh, theaters pop back up. Yeah. I, I think it will make a some, some way, some sort of a comeback of, of like small mom and pops theaters, local theaters. And I think people will go back to filmmaking. It's just like how people went back to vinyl, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the last what, couple of years, you saw now people, uh, stores and even big stores selling like Target and, and Walmart and, and, and they have records they sell. Even like you go to Barnes and Nobles, even though that's an also dying art books. And, uh, you know, they have a, a section of, of vinyl records in the back. <clears throat> so I, I think it will, you know, um, some way come back. Just, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I just... It just uh everything goes around right and i think this time that we live right now with this whole covid and what filmmaking is about is a little bit awkward that's true but it's also kind of a great reset in a way i i, th- I think it's going to kind of push things to a place where it's like okay what's next what do we do now 
Um, yeah, I, I think the reset is really important because what we learn is like what we're doing now is not working. Um, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is like um, art is being dictated by the mind police. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into these whole, you know, politics and stuff like that. But most of these projects that we're watching streaming service are being dictated by, you know, very few people. And they're like the mind police. And art, that's not art. And I leave it to that. You know, I don't want to get a little bit further than that. But I think that's sure. what's great about the reset button that says, OK, this shit ain't working, dude. The stuff that we're watching is the same shit we're watching. It's the same look we're watching every goddamn week. The new movie that comes out in the stream service, why does it look just like this film? And it looks just like that film. And why does it look that film? There's a formula now. And the formula is mm -hmm. starting to get played out. And sorry to yeah. say, the Marvels are starting to get played out. You know, <clears throat> and I love it. We're all Marvel freaks, fans, and everything like that. But it's starting to look and feel the same. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you change it to rated R, let's get it going. But if you're going to keep it a PG-13, it's just going to same old sort of kind of feel to it and everything. And I think just that's the reset button. People are like, hmm, I think it's time for something different. Right. Um, this stuff is not working. And I'm not saying that Marvel doesn't work. I mean, this is great. A lot of Marvel movies and stuff like that. But I think that there should be room for other stuff like any filmmakers like us you know that we're not getting that sort of like you know they're not giving us that room you know that we kind of had a little bit before covid now we don't even have it anymore yeah so and we talked a little bit about that off air that it's it's when you go to the theater today pretty much all you see are franchise films that's all anybody watches anymore in the theaters you know yeah. and, and <clears throat> when i interviewed harrison smith he touched on that that like you go to a theater today and there's you know seven auditoriums dedicated to you know a marvel film and but you don't you don't see something like Death House. You don't see something like Zombie with a Shotgun. But thankfully, there are theaters out there. Like I know in Nashville, there's one called Belcourt Theater. And I actually got to see one of George Romero's last films. I got to see Diary of the Dead at that. That was the greatest. I would say that was the greatest movie theater experience I've ever had. I, I th this movie came out. I'm a Romero fan. It's like I have to see this. And the closest awesome. place I knew it was playing was Atlanta. I was going to drive to Atlanta, Georgia to watch Diary of the Dead. And then one day I discovered it was playing at Belcourt Theater, which is in downtown Nashville. Oh, so awesome. it's near it's near Vanderbilt, I think, actually. I think it's near the, the – I might have that wrong. It's been a while since I've moved out of Nashville. But but I, 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 I went to this theater, man. I'm so pumped. I'm going to see the new Ramiro film. I, I buy – they sell beer. You, you can have a beer while you watch a, a movie there. I bought, it was the flattest beer I've ever had. It was a flat Budweiser, man. I'll never forget it. It was so <laughs> flat, but I did not care. I sat in that theater and I watched that movie and I remember leaving that theater Hilton and I, I, I felt alive. It, it, it just, I felt, uh, I, 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 I was, bet. I bet I was so grateful to be alive because I, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly. I just <clears> felt <throat> alive, you know? I, and and that's that's something I don't ever I don't ever want to see that die. I want everybody to get to have that experience that you you know you get to watch. And that's yeah. something you can only get from the theater. Like you can't have that at home. I know. It's, it's just sad, you know. It's like, you know, it, you know. Here's a sad thing, you know. It's just a, a lot of a lot of a lot of old things, or well, I wouldn't say old things. A, a lot of things that we experience, like you know, it's uh, the, the you know the commercial, the big boys taking over, right? You know, with having even just walmart and target and home depot open during this whole pandemic but telling mom and pop shops you can't was a way of saying hey you know we're going to survive and we're going to crush you and also that 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 is sort of like the same thing what's happening with the whole filmmaking world kind of thing you know big boys survive and the little guys die mm -hmm. and then and that's when it comes to where it comes where you said that reset button needs to happen some time and just basically say, hey, you know what, we, you know, we, we need to see things different. We need to have more experiences than just this one sort of experience that you're trying to tell us to have and yeah. stop telling us to have this one experience because it's not joyful anymore. And um, maybe it was never joyful, but we want something different. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, again, the whole uh, starting all over would be good. As I have these conversations, there's definitely a birth because I, I, that's a theme I hear. It's it's it, I almost want to call it a birth pain. There's a cry for something different. The unfortunate thing is when people do things that are different, it's not well received. It's like people will cry for something different. We're tired of seeing the same thing. Do something different. Somebody does that and then it just fails. But I, I think I think we're really seeing the birth pains of of that great reset in cinema. And 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 I would venture to say, Hilton, that 
eventually David always defeats Goliath, you know, and, and I think that's eventually what we're going to see in film. Eventually David's going to defeat Goliath and you're going to maybe see a return back to what it was like maybe in the eighties and the nineties or even in the seventies. I'm, I'm hoping that's what we're going to see. So let me, let me ask you this. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of shift, we'll shift back to, cause I know people want to hear about more about your films. Zombie with a shotgun. Where, yeah. where did that idea come from? The idea came uh, years ago. Um, you're going to laugh at this one. So you remember the whole H1Z1 kind of a sickness that came in. And I decided oh, yeah. to do one called Z1 H1 kind of zombie virus kind of thing. And we were trying to get this uh, whole idea going. And just, you know, it didn't work out and everything like that. I wrote this whole script on it and everything. And it didn't work out. So I I wanted to do my own interpretation of zombie film. So my actor, my lead actor, him and I were good friends. And then I just told him, hey, look, man, I want to do this web series. And if you know, he's also in the other web series, 666. So we mm-hmm. he was on both, both of them, but he's the main one, zombie. I told him I want to do a whole zombie um, web series, my interpretation of the point of view of the zombie, because no one ever talks about it. And he was like, oh, okay. He was like, yeah, let's do it. So trying to find a title for the film is like how many zombie films come out and not having a, a, a title, which not be catchy was a hard one. Cause that's basically a lot of it when it comes to the zombie film is trying to get this catchy title, which was zombie with a shotgun. And a lot of it has also got expired because, you know, when the Hobo with Shotgun came out, he's like, oh, look, Zombie with Shotgun would be really awesome to have. The thing is that a lot of people, when they watch the film, they, they expect it to be sort of like a Hobo with a Shotgun, which is completely different. It's no way even close to it. Yeah. So there was this sort of like, oh, you can't you can't have the Zombie with Shotgun. You're not, you're not going to have it like all crazy. So, you know, doing a film that was really – there you go also what you said, doing something that was really different. I did something different. And not a lot of people appreciated it. They were like, oh, God, you know, zombies can't really talk. Zombies can't really, you know, you know, why is a zombie guy kissing? How is a zombie guy able to hold a gun? You can't do it. And it hurt a lot of people, believe it or not. People were so upset that you can't change the mythology of zombies. Why not? I mean, if you really think about it, zombie mythology was changed when Michael Jackson came and fucking bust the moves right in Thriller Video. The, <laughs> the mythology was changed right there and then. Why did it never spun off from there? It went back from Michael Jackson doing his crazy moves, you know, learning how to dance, communicate. He was focusing, looking at his girl, chasing her. He knew what he was doing, everything. He was a kick-ass zombie, really think about it. But then it went back to brains and this and that. So I started to tell people, this mythology was dead when, when Michael Jackson was doing his moves. What are you talking about? And people, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm right. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> believe it or not, Zombie with Shotgun was inspired. The makeup was inspired from um, Michael Jackson's Thriller. We took a little bit of uh, his look for Thriller, and I mixed it up with a m- new modern age zombie. Um, so, if you look at it, it, it has that little element of uh, Michael Jackson's uh, Thriller uh, makeup on it, and that was also a big sort of like you know, m- you know, point that I wanted to make was that you know it was the mythology changed years ago it's just that we went back to it now I'm coming back with this whole thing so people were really upset about that though it was just strange and everything and I wanted to do something different I wanted to do a whole love story and I'm not gonna lie to you I'll tell you the truth I have never in a million years ever thought Zion Shotgun would take off this big I didn't think that it would go viral I didn't think I would have such a huge following I didn't think that people would go crazy to watch the feature and then doing the feature and then doing the comic I just didn't think so but it it, it just took on its own life and why not you know this is what we as filmmakers we work on right we do projects to try to catch a wave and i caught that wave you know what i mean and uh it's a pretty awesome you know wave and 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 a lot of fans i I just really appreciate from a lot of people that really came and supported me to make this film and we are going on a new campaign next month believe it or not for zombie shotgun part two Uh, a lot of fans is calling for it Um, i think it's time before the pandemic the investors were going we i had investors that wanted to do a sequel that's all dead so you know talking to some producers i'm like dude we're not going to get any money dude it's just you know we're so indie and everything and people are scared to put the investment especially what's going around the world now so we decided we're going to go i have started a patreon to you know for the sequel to start you know um, and with this uh, new campaign next month, we, we are, we're hoping the fans will come back and support it. And this time around, you know, telling the fans and, you know, a lot of the fans that really loved the first one also want to see some kick-ass zombie. I promised them that this was going to be the kick-ass 
shoot 'em up zombie film that they all wanted for the first one, and I'm going to give it to them in the sequel. One of the things I like a lot about the uh, the, the feature film, um, I'm really glad you opened up on Braden with the uh, the makeup, the way it was, like 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 that that final that final makeup because it's it's so good. That makeup is so good. <laughs> that makeup was amazing. And, you know, and I, I try to go into the whole, you know, sort of old fashioned sort of filmmaking. You know, you get the story, you get the story spinning up in the very end. You get to see that final hurrah and everything. Listen, we wanted to shoot more. We ran out of money. Um, and, you know, and, and that's why, you know, when you watch the film it's to be continued, you know what I mean? And we did. We we there's there's no and that is the, the truth. We completely ran out of money and we couldn't shoot anymore. And we wanted to continue. We wanted to go 10 to 15 minutes more with that makeup and go on it. Just we couldn't afford it. Um, literally went broke. And we were like, fuck, we got no money, dude. And we would remember it, it took us three years to do it. So, you know, I during those three years, not a lot of people know that we went on like four or five different campaigns to do different scenes. So it wasn't like that first initial 10 to 12 days we shot the film, the, you know, 70 percent of the film. And then we ran out of money. Then I had to go on another campaign to do another scene. Boom. We had to go on another campaign. Boom. Then I see we got another campaign soon. And then the last campaign was to get this final makeup job. And we wanted to go 10, 15 minutes, but we raised just enough to shoot that final scene. And I made the decision to say, okay, should we go back on a campaign and get the fans? You know, I don't want to keep on begging the fans. The fans are like, oh, dude, it's three years. When your film is going to come out? It's hitting three years. I get it. I get that, you know, you had a lot of people who committed to the project and everything was just so, so I was like, I made that decision that, look, let's just end it now. We go on another campaign and it, this, it might be another six months, you know? So, you know, you got to wait for two months for the campaign to finish. Then you got to, you know, prepare for another month. Then you have to get guys to fly into New York or where we're going to fly and then shoot and then we got to come back and cut it. It could be another six months and we got to get the music, got the sound mix, blah, blah, blah. Six months, basically. I don't think people was ready for that. You know what I mean? So I decided to finish um, and went with it. Um, you know, again, I'm happy with it. And November 2019 of I think November 28th is when it premiered and unfortunately less than three months the world got locked down with COVID and and I feel that it never got the opportunity that it sh- that it should have gotten should have could have whatever right we could always say that bullshit right should have could have whatever right but it feel like it didn't get that opportunity because it just was released it was streaming and I was literally getting like every week getting reviews, getting people want to interview me. When are we going to do the freaking conventions? Boom, dead. And it just felt like it's just like, damn, I, I got just this, this. I got fucking ripped off for it. But again, what was amazing, the fans still supported it. They still watched the film. They still sent me messages. You know, everyone stayed home, you know, COVID watching the film and just giving me great feedback. And I just was so, like, happy that fans were still, yeah, we'll watch it. And no matter what, even during the COVID, we're going to watch this. And it just, you know, it did kept on going with the fans and everything like that. And then you started worried a lot of me being an artist, filmmaker, started worrying me like, oh, man, where are we going to go now? You know, now this whole thing and everything. So... Now that we're like the smoke is kind of clearing out, I think it's time we get to the second one. That's yeah, man. I, I and you're you're more than welcome back on the show during that campaign. I, I'd love to have you on, and you can even bring the cast if you want. We can all have a big round table and talk about it. And it, it, I'd, I'd be more than happy to to have you guys. On. That sounds it's, awesome. It's um, I, I you know I would love to see you do a um, and I I don't even know how to put this together, but like I, just just the filmmaker that you are. And, and the talent that you have and the history you have with film, I would love to see you do like a cross country thing where you go to schools or, well, maybe uh, you probably couldn't show your films at schools, but, but like not high schools, but like colleges you could, but I would love to see you go cross country and go to like art house theaters and stuff and do like a, um, almost like a master class, like show, show zombie with a shotgun, show clans rules show, and, and, and definitely show survival as well. Show some of your work. And and then have like a and I would love to see you do something like that because man, just filmmakers like you, you have so much to offer the world. There yeah, there are so that, many, man. actually, there are so many people out there that want to be you, but what they need is a mentor like you. 
and and because you have the experience, because you're a, a veteran filmmaker, because you've gotten to get out in the trenches and even work with with 16 millimeter film, people need Hiltons. They need they need the Harrison Smiths. Like they need mentors like you guys. I would love to see you do something like that. I, I, I would be really really incredible. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thank you for the kind words, man. Absolutely. You know, and I would love to do something like that. You know, and um, you know, it's interesting that you say survival, and uh, that's pretty interesting because you know it's like. You know, you look at survival and it's six minutes, right? And you look at my first episode, Sami was shotgun, right? It's about five to six minutes, right? But if you really look at the film, it's the same film, right? You look at the film and how it ends. And if you, you know, and, and I tell so only certain people, I would tell people, you look at it, the same film. You have, you know, the buildup and everything like that. And then you look at the gunshot. It's the same sort of gunshot. Gunshot by the camera, boom. When that gunshot goes off, you get to cut to this whole new feel. Same thing with survival. When the gunshot goes off, boom, you get this whole new feel. And it's it's a it's pretty cool from what 1996 looked to 2012. That's mm-hmm. when that film was shot. The first episode of Zion was shot. And we're actually going 10 years in August. Of Zion with shotgun, and that's what oh, I tell wow. a lot of people, man. You know, you love your passion, you love it. Just keep on doing it, man. Just keep on doing it, you know. And that's exactly what I kept doing, and I'm still doing it. So it's a pretty cool sort of like look at that. And you know, I didn't even really realize that until one day I started looking at survival. I'm like, oh shit, it's the same damn film. It's the same sort of like technique, and I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> it's it's just you know it, it was only it, it, and and it's and, and I'm as you're talking I'm thinking too it's like that that's a really special piece of film just in the six minutes it, yeah it, it really had an impact on me because you know you know what, it's so funny I I, it, I I think I told you this before I think it's going to hold up probably one of my best pieces of all time even my even my little ones I always ask them. Well, they're not little anymore. It's a freaking, you know, someone in their twenties now. You know, they, they, they uh, I ask them, say, oh, what do you like? And they always go back to that film. And you know what they say? They say, I remember the first time I saw that film because I did show them, and I showed them all in the same way, right? So I showed my little ones on a steam back, and they all looked at it, and they were like, "What the hell is this machine? What the <laughs> hell is the, this?" this thing so then it's just so funny though when you at, and i yeah, that's years ago i showed them and then i look at it and i tell them what's my favorite and they always go back to that they go that one he said i remember the first time i saw it i thought it was the most amazing thing i said what is this black and white what is this machine that, it took such an impact in on them to this day they still talk about it and i showed them to like when they were like six or seven years old and they still remember it and i think that to me felt like yeah that that film is very important it's just, it's just so powerful. I mean, I can't really, I mean, in six minutes, you're able to break my heart. You know, I, I, oh, I think man. this, I, I, I think this man survived and he does not And you're just seeing, you're sitting there seeing yeah. him on the. And, he, and here's a funny thing. I was inspired by a black and white. Um, oh my God. I'm going to be so pissed off that I don't remember to tell you the film because I was inspired by it. And it was a black and white film that was done in the possibly 50s uh, about this guy who escapes i think it was a uh, um oh my god during war and he he's about to get hung and when he gets hung he he imagines him getting hung but the string just collapses and he runs to his loved one but when he gets to her he gets hung it's a very 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 famous short film i i'm, I'm so I'm, i can't even believe it. i don't even remember it right now oh my god it's so embarrassing because that's what got inspired for me to do it and I remember watching that film and I watched it in film school and I was like, oh, my God, what a fucking short film it was. Same thing, like five, six minutes. And then um, I went to see the movie Heat, like a man, right? Film, Al Pacino, mm-hmm. Robert De Niro. And the greatest soundtrack, gun battle in any film, man. <laughs> yes. Soundtrack was so inspiring. And I remember going home. I, I didn't actually go home. I remember going to. Um, I'm going to sound old record shop. I forgot it was even Tower Records at that time. And I bought the soundtrack, came home, and I listened to the whole soundtrack. Remember those days, right? I listened to yeah. the whole soundtrack. And there in my bedroom, listened to some soundtrack, I came up with that idea. I said, oh, my God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a sort of like 
urban sort of feel, sort of like a New York City take of that film that inspired me. And uh, you would believe this, though, too. I have friends that I've gone to school, you know, 20 years ago, and they still talk about that film. It's just really powerful. It's it's one of those things, and you probably could have, you probably could never have imagined it would turn out as powerful as it did. I mean, no. Uh, and I did something that was sort of kind of like foolish, but again, you're young, dumb, whatever. You know, like I really didn't show anybody the film. Like it won like a war, you know, like it won like like the best, you know, my project I did for the class and everything. People was talking, people was telling me, oh, you should bring out the film festivals and everything like that. And during that time, I brought in film festivals. I think I probably would want all the film festivals. But at that time, I mean, I just, you know, when you're young, you kind of, you're, you're dumb, right? <laughs> I feel oh, yeah. like I wasn't ready. I feel like, oh my God, I don't think this project's really that good. I don't think I'm ready for this time. I really don't think I could do this. I think I need more experience and everything. And I think back at it, I'm like, damn, if I fucking wanted to put that film, I would have just, would have been, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, uh, but hey, look, whatever. It, and then you know it, it's still you know it's still out it's still at the time but everyone that i like i said i went to school 20 years ago still always tells me hey you got that product yep i got it online you want to see it <laughs> so that's that's the cool could, thing well could you not submit it to a festival now uh it's not the same you know i, I, I mean, disagree uh, man I, I, I honestly hilton like I, i'm going on a limb here man that film needs to be seen uh, I, yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think a lot of people, the, the people that a lot of my fans that see it really appreciate it a lot. I think it hasn't really made that sort of like crossover to somebody else that like would like the crossover of like film, film, like oh my god, how come we didn't, you know? And yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I should should test the waters out and see what what other film festivals take it. I just, yeah, I just feel like you know the project is aged, you know, but aged and very like wine, fine. <laughs> It's it's a timeless piece of. I mean, in six minutes, you you almost brought me to tears when you're looking at that man dead at the very end, and he and he he, it, it's hard to play a corpse, and he did it right. It just it's just he, so powerful. I I, I, did, I actually didn't expect to talk about this movie this much. But yeah, like, no, just, I've 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 had conversations a lot. I had um podcasted before talk about this film. Yeah, I no, it is it's you know uh, Kevin was a it was a. Uh, um, again, you know, when you start filming, you, you get your your friends, you know, to do your films. So that was uh, that was my really good friend um, in my neighborhood. And that was actually his girlfriend in real life. So I told him, hey, let's make a film. Would your girlfriend want to be in the film? And the, the police officer and the other female, they were actually in my um, film school. And um, they they participated in being in the film. The guy played a cop and. Uh, he was from actually from Germany, and he came down to New York to do a film school. And uh, great, what a great guy he was, man! He played that part freaking to the par, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I still remember because you know he was he was from Germany, and you know he just coming to New York basically for the first time. He's here less than like I don't know a month, and he's here in New York City, and we're like hanging out. And then when we gave him the prop gun, he's holding it everywhere, and I'm telling him, no, no, put hide the gun. So. I think that's why the scene worked very well because he was so nonchalant. Oh, what was a big deal? I could put a gun out. You know what I mean? If I asked an actor that's from here in New York, he probably would have never done that scene because he'd be so scared. Like, oh my God, the cops is going to shoot me, arrest me. But, you know, even then you still could have gone now. It's even worse. And nobody would even do it. Even a foreigner wouldn't even do it. So I think that helped a lot in the scene because he was so nonchalant less than a month here in New York City. He just didn't think it was a big deal to hold a gun and run with a gun <laughs> down the subway and out the subway and holding it up. And even me shooting, I was really scared. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's just bringing me flashbacks. And I thought it was just so awesome because every time I look at it, I'm like, damn, I can't even. That could never fly now. That yeah. would never fly with the amount of cameras and you know, in every single corner of New York City, basically, and and subway, and it would have been like, you would have saw me in the six o'clock news. Filmmaker gets arrested with crew. <laughs> <laughs> but but that but that's what makes it so special, though, man. The fact that you, yeah. you did do it, you know, and, and, and you I and I told it today. everybody too. I told everybody if anybody gets arrested, I'm going down. I said I don't care. Just take the equipment take everything i said i'm gonna i'll get i i said i do remember still i, said, I will get locked to this it's okay 
if anything I told you guys to do it, it's you know my prop, whatever. I didn't care. But again, it's a uh, yeah, it was a uh, you know different times now, you know. You you and 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 this and I mean this when I say this. That film is so well done. You could almost teach an independent filmmaking class purely off of it. You could spend a semester breaking it apart. What did he do right? What did the editing process look like? You know, the fact that you're able to communicate the emotion you did in six minutes with no dialogue. You know, it's it's a silent film. I think there was some, some voice in it at one point, if I recall correctly. It was the, the I think there were cops. Just the really. police, the police, the yeah. CB radio, yeah. And that was, it's funny you said that because that was the, the assignment was to tell a story without dialogue and that was the assignment and i said oh and that's when i said when i trying to get to what am i going to do it, it was those two elements put together me watching that short film and me going home and watching the heat soundtrack which is on that film so it's, it's just uh, it's it's an amazing piece of work. I, I I really I would love to see you submit it to festivals. I really would. I think. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think I never even I never like thought about it like in that way. But me, maybe, maybe I should test out the waters, like you said. Yeah, let, you, let me know, man. If if I can help in any way with that, I, I I would I would love to see that. It's just it's an incredible piece of film. So, too, if if you don't mind, let's let's talk a minute about Clans Rules. Where where did the idea for clans clans rules come from? Clans rules is also really interesting. All oh, these things, all oh, these guys, are interesting story. So I would say back in my college years, um, we're going back probably around 1999. I would say around 99. Um, I was this is when I was going into doing commercial photography, learning commercial uh, photography. Um, I actually went to uh, Fashion Institute of Technology to learn. Uh, fashion photography and at the same time was you know still dabbling with filmmaking also writing scripts and doing short films and stuff like that i had wrote a script about a ku klux klan um a ku klux klan and a detective that a a vampire clan during slavery times and the ku klux klan that are in this sort of midst of you know fighting a war and there's these murders that are happening among the Ku Klux Klan and the vampires. And I wrote this screenplay and I thought it was awesome. And, you know, a 1999, let's go back to 1999, you know, uh, submitting a script like that, mm, too touchy. Uh, Ku Klux Klan, mm -mm, we're not going to show this kind of stuff. Slavery vamp, a vampire during slavery times, mm -mm. It's, it was such a like a touchy, feely story for the late 90s no mm. one would want to touch that film okay nobody but i wrote it because i'm sort of that unconventional guy that i'm gonna write these things that i really like and so that whole idea came uh together um so yeah so then i came up to the short film and this is it's funny because uh harrison smith is in the story because harrison smith called me about some vampire ideas and stuff and i told him about my idea and he was like holy shit that would be great if you did it in a short film and i'm like oh i never even thought about that you know what i mean he thought the film this the idea was so good to do it in like in a short film um you know so i decided to um do it in a short version during covid that was a crazy thing to do during covid during the first year of covid to try to do this short film um so i took the two i the, the ideas and i i said i couldn't i can't shoot the feature because the feature um you know i would have to go back to the script the script needs a lot of work because then i wrote this like 20 over 20 years ago so it's different ideas different stuff we're about to go back but i took the same sort of elements you know of it you know Instead of the detective, there was this like sort of like vigilante guy out there and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Something I could do like a New York kind of feel with it because the script didn't really have a New York vibe with it. It was sort of like a different sort of like maybe like Midwest or mid whatever, middle of America, rural America kind of feel to it. So I wanted to make it to like a New York kind of like feel to it. And the, the one thing that I learned was really hard was uh, casting you know, during COVID. But if but the good thing was that the main vampire um, was also at the end of Zombie with a Shotgun, the landlord scene when he gets shot. He was a good friend of mine. And when I thought of the idea, believe it or not, he was the first guy I thought about. I said, this is the only way it's going to work out if Faison would be the main actor 
And uh, I said to myself, I'm going to write the script, right? And then I'm going to call him. And if he doesn't want to do it, we're not going to do it. And it's just that's how I felt strong. I felt like he needed to be the guy. And because of COVID, it was going to be really difficult to get. You know, I, need, I needed to get a bunch of friends that I knew to come around. And I called him up. He was like, hell yeah. So we did that. And then, um, and then slowly but surely, everything body started casting. And I had a friend that came on and had another friend that I knew and then another friend. So it worked out very well. It was really hard, but everyone agreed to go in COVID times. And um, yeah, we shot the project and uh, it came out. Um, it came out pretty, it, it was amazing. I, you know, the thing is, is that I didn't expect so many people. And I think we talked about this before that so many people said, dude, you need to continue this project. Oh yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I, and that's, that's the feedback. He would say, dude, you need to do a series. You need to do uh, – one guy told me I should do a comic book off of the idea. And, uh, you know, and again, the whole thing was, uh, um, you know, the whole thing is money. You know, who's going to, who's gonna, you know, invest in this project? You know, money now is really tight during, you know, this whole time period. No one's going to invest. Maybe yeah. – you know, here's the thing is during – if it was – and I think about this. If it was COVID, if COVID never existed, I probably would have never done that project. So it's like a catch-22, right? If – I did this film before COVID. I probably would have got somebody to give me money to finance to a comic book or movie, movie, but I probably wouldn't even do the film. But since COVID, I did it because COVID exists. Um, no one's going to invest because no one has that sort of money. I mean, if I, if I went hard on it, maybe and everything like that, but the feedback started coming back that they, that, that they wanted um, to see more. There should be a continuing, there should be a comic book. But yes, to go back to it, that was how that film came together. Of it was an idea that came like around 1998, 99, that I, you know, pitched around and I gave hope on it because the time, uh, times is different now. I think this is a script that people would want to see now, you know, especially the climate of what we go through and everything. Um, but yeah, yeah, and, and I. The ending of my original script was that at the end it was just a. Uh, it's just so interesting because it's 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 like what's happening now. And the end of that original script was that the the head Ku Klux Klan and the head of the um, uh, vampire during slavery times, um, they all planned this so they could always have division. And it's just like how we're doing now. And you find that at the end, it was just all that stuff was just planned for them just to keep in power, keep them divided. You just have some sort of thing going on forever. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I would love, you know, you never know. There might be that day, that time or, you know, where I can get sort of the keys of like, hey, we want we got money for you. You know, what ideas would you do? Clans rules would be top there. Be one of those top stories to go back and uh, resurface. It's it's a good story and, and it's versatile enough to to do a comic to do a web series to do a full feature film. It's funny because actually when I was watching it, um, when it, when it was over with, I, it 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 inspired an idea for me of something I would I would like to do one day. Like I've always been really into to mafia films, um, and uh, the the idea occurred to me like, what if you did a mafia film that it it's it's like. I don't know, so it's not universal monsters, but like all of the families are different types of monsters. So like one family is all mummies. One family is all zombies. One family is all vampires. Uh, you know, one family is all werewolves and they're at war with each other. Um, you know, because it, it, it all, I don't know, it's just something about the way the movie went down. It, it almost made me feel like it was almost a mafia story in a way. And, and it just, and that idea came to mind. Yeah, I, I think also because the, the 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 one of the main guys, the the guy who was looking for the pill, he came off, um, you know, him also being Italian, it came off sort of like a a mob thing. And it's funny that you say that because that was the the feel of him to act. You know, that that was the what he when when we spoke, I told him you, you're like this mob guy, but we don't want to put it out like you're like this. Hey, yo, what up? You know, I'm a, you know. I'm down with here and Gino's, you know, we didn't want to give that sort of like stereotype, like Goomba kind of like mafia guy, but he played it off like a mafia guy. And I think that little thing played it off like sort of like a mafia thing going on with all the three parties. I loved his character. I loved his character. He he did such a good job. The, the mob guy. Yeah. 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 I loved his character. Um, And even, even the head vampire. 
um, I, 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 I just, it, it was, it was a really, it was really well cast. I really enjoyed it. It was a great story. And, and yeah, you know, I, we, I, we had talked about it. Go, go I have to say that I have to say that the casting was, was, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is luck and, you know, a lot of people, um, that I casted turned it down and I'm like, oh man, I got to go to this person. And then they turned, they went on it and then last minute they turned it down. So, so many, because, because it was COVID. So many people agreed and turned down. So a lot of the actors were like another choice. And then when I look back at it, I said, you know what? I don't, I think the other people that were supposed to be in the film, this person didn't, would I don't think they would have done a better job than the person that's in the film. So it, everything was, uh, was casted, you know, perfectly. Um, and the, the head Ku uh, uh, Klux Klan guy, uh, man, that guy's awesome, dude. He, came in literally last minute because somebody bailed out and he was like yeah i'll do it last i mean literally a night before spoke to him told him the whole role and everything he goes yeah let's do it and it was just fucking amazing i and that what scares me because when you get somebody last minute like damn you know this is this is already not going good yeah and first day he he came in the very first day knocked it out everything was just everything was good Oh, I want to talk about the ending, but like it, it'll be spoilers. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it. But then, then like the, the what comes out with him at the end, <laughs> it's like yes, yes. Uh, man, I, yes. I, I really, I really do hope you, you do more with that. When, when I watched that, I was like, this is my favorite right here. This and Survivor, are like the, these are my favorite Hilton projects. Um, and 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 one other thing I want to tell you too, I was so tempted to text this to you last night because I was, I was just like. I, 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 you're, you're, what I love the most about your work, your cinematography is amazing. Like you, you, you have some of the best cinematography I've ever seen. Your musical scores are amazing. They are amazing. Like every, everything I've watched by you, the music is phenomenal. You score your, your work very well. I also love your use of your aerial shots. That's the other thing. Like in Zombie Man. Yeah. Your aerial shots are so good. Thank you. <laughs> like thank you had these so, beautiful I, vistas of New York. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you some some footnotes on that. So on my aerial guy, he's a he. You know, again, being in in, in filmmaking for a while, you get to get to know a lot of people, and wh- he's one of them. Uh, Glenn is a professional aerial uh, a drone. I mean, he's he's done drones for like double seven. He's done all that stuff, and he. He just literally lived down the block from me, and that's how I got to know him. And we would talk about films and stuff like that. And when we were doing Zombie with a Shotgun and other stuff, you know, like especially with Zombie Shotgun that I brought him on, you know, I didn't have the balls to be like, hey, I got this independent film. Can you do Zombie? You know, can you do some air shots for me? Right? You know? So it was sort of like, you know, you're friends, but you don't want to like kind of cross that line, like, you know, you know, because I know he's he does it like, you know, very, you know, I mean, I can imagine. But he gets paid for doing it, you know, huge $150 million budget compared to a guy that probably could take him, can only afford just to take him out to like freaking McDonald's or something, you know what I mean? Or like yeah. a, or some sort of a nice Cuban restaurant or anything like that. So I was like, and, you know, I just literally say, hey, man, you know, and he just looked at me because he knew I was going to ask. I said, I need sushi. He was like, fuck yeah, man, I'll do it for you. You know, and he was awesome. He did it for me. We 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 snuck there uh, five o'clock in the morning in the Brooklyn Navy Yard to shoot those zombie houses. That was that whole thing was just crazy what we did. And we just crazy things that going on top of roofs in the city. And, and it was just amazing the stuff that he did. It was just awesome. And uh, and we did. um, Yeah, he he did it. He did a, a, a fabulous job. And uh, and we're going to the scoring. Scoring means, yeah, you're right. And and it's lucky because I met this uh, David Bateman. He's become my music guy. And um, I met him, I would say, like, uh, during, um, like, yeah, over 10 years, he's been scoring my films. And he's become this huge um, composer for... <laughs> I don't even know many films for every single network from Netflix and you just look at his character. And he, when I met him, he wasn't established as he is now. Now he is woof. He's got a catalog now of like music he's done for huge major networks, movies and everything. And people like this, you got to respect and you love, you know, because again, I could imagine what he charges these 
big, huge films. But here, him and I have such an amazing friendship. You know, I say, look, I got this film. He's like, don't worry, dude, I got it. Uh, and that helps a lot. You know, he's such a very seasoned and experienced composer and a very, very good composer. And it just seems like, you know, that that to me, it's very important luck because on my side on that. And uh, uh, just having that friendship, you know, like, you know, just giving him that, you know. Um, and yeah, he, he scored, um, you know, uh, 666. He did he did all the scores for the 666, Clans Rules, Zangri Shotgun. He did all my five episodes. He's just uh, an amazing uh, composer. Well, man, let let him know that I'm a big fan of his work because he yeah. he does. I it's just it, it's I it's just it's so your 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 work is so well scored it sticks out to you, like like it's literally you know you watch a movie it you know the mu- the music's ambiance it adds to the, like I I don't think I've ever watched something outside of maybe like Dawn of the Dead where the score like it really stuck out to me like wow this is really well scored. And I've seen that on multiple things. And hey, I'll tell you something else, man. And this this is a compliment. I mean, this purely complimentary. Uh, watching watching the, uh, the the 66 web series, you've done something not many horror directors have done. You made me cringe. I I I, I I've you know I watched Night Living Dead as a kid. I've I've you know I've I've seen some some horrible horrible gory stuff. I want to say was the only two filmmakers that have ever made me just go oh. Are Lucio Fulci and you, and where no you way. got me? I, I'm not kidding. And where you got me was the the last episode of Six 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 when she has him tied up to the table and she yeah. keeps running that knife through the wound. <laughs> every time you did that, man. Every time I was like, oh my god! I, I literally, I was like, oh, I had trouble watching it. It really, she, she uh, just kept running the knife through the wound. You did something not many people have done. You made me actually kind of cringe a little bit. Oh, that's bit. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, so, like, <laughs> those those three episodes to me also was amazingly cast. Uh, again, that's luck. Um, you know, you you just you you look a lot. I do all my casting, and I just I, there's a feel to a lot of the characters, and I think that could be a knack also that I do have because yeah. everything that you see, like ninety five percent, I've cast. I see the part, I see the person, and I'm like, hey, this is the person. This is the act. This is the this is the person who's gonna do it. And and you know, I would say most of the time, 90%, I hit it off. 10% is like, eh, okay, I thought I get, but it's still the he has the look. My whole important thing about that whole thing is that he has to have he or she has to have the look of the part. I feel like if she screws he or she screws up the scene, you say, you know what? Stunk up the scene, but the part looks the part, all right? Instead of having somebody that could do the scene very well and then doesn't look the part, you know? And it's funny because I uh, heard a podcast with really Scott and he said the same exact thing I said. And I was like, oh shit. So he's, you know, like, it was just so cool that he said, I was like, oh wow, so I kind of felt happy with myself. But <laughs> so oh, yeah. the I whole 666, so. we wanted to, what I wanted to do with 666, basically the three episodes that I did was, Three different stories, completely three different stories, but the same sort of, I you know about the same evil entity. All different actors, of course, and all three different DPs. So I wanted to have a different look for all three of them, and different cameramen, different DPs, and different actors, and a different story. And that's what I wanted to do. And then um, after that. You know, again, I, I, I had mentioned that I'm going to put 666 um, in a anthology with eight short films. And then you see some of the cast members coming back to other episodes because after a while, it's like, all right, let me bring I can fix this story and I can come back. But that was the main thing with those first three of them. And casting was very, uh, again, just luck. A lot of the times the gods up there just helped out. And uh, that was a pretty cool scene that last uh, the third episode with the with the girl with the knife that was a pretty cool. <laughs> I like it that. was like, it was rough, man. And, and and I'll tell you, it it it's what makes it so good is that it's not the fact like it 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 actually would have been less intense to me had she just cut him up a bunch. But it's the fact that she kept going after the same wound, rubbing the knife through the same wound, and then licking it. It, it literally, I was like, oh, like it it really made me cringe, man. Like I like kudos to you. The the only other person I think that's ever done that to me is Lucio Fulci. 
Seriously. No, that's awesome. That's, that's, that, that, that feels good. Oh man. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Listen, um, I want to, I want to, uh, shift gears a little bit because I know we're, we're kind of, we're kind of hitting an hour and a half and I know you probably got a lot going on today. I, one of the, one of the, the last couple of questions I want to ask you, and, and, I, and I like to ask filmmakers this because I, I, what, one of the audiences I hope to have for my podcast are, are up and coming filmmakers or people who are aspiring to be filmmakers. What, what advice would you give to the person that's sitting at home right now who's working a nine to five, who dreams of being the Spielberg, who dreams of, of they, they have all these ideas, they have scripts out there. What advice would you give to them? What would you tell them to do? All right. You know, a lot of these guys, nine to five guys, I know how it is, man. You know, I tell them this, man. I know exactly how it is because we all, you know, there's some times in my life, in my period, of course, you know, uh, I am an indie filmmaker. Uh, I really believe I'm a true indie filmmaker out there. I'm doing indie films from raising money from people that are not from the, you know, the, the industry or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And going in a nine to five job, um, one of the things that it does, because I, ha- you know, there's times that we have to do it. I have to go back. So I, I experienced what a lot of these nine fives go. So I say, oh man, I got to, you know, I have to go get a real job, as they would say, right? I got to get a nine to five job, right? So when you get that nine to five job, the thing that it does, it kills the spirit. It kills the spirit of being an artist. And that's the the key of of going out and trying to be this artist, this filmmaker, to get that spirit up, have that sort of, you know, love and feel for it. Because I tell you, when I would go back to nine to five job, I can't take it after three or four months because it's like, it killed my spirit. Come home, you're exhausted, you're tired. You might have the family, you might have the wife, the kids, whatever, things got things. Weekends, you're booked, you gotta take this to this person, you gotta go to this, you gotta do all this stuff. Ah, man, it's very difficult, but you can make time. All right. You can make time. The time that you can make is try to take a three day weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to shoot a short film or even your vacation time, which might be hard, especially if you have wife and kids, you might get in trouble for this. But you got to know that you got to let them know that this is what you love. This is what you want to do. Have them participate in some way, somehow in the project to make them feel like they're part of it and stuff like that. And take that. Take some time. You have to take time. You know, again, write your script, write your story, write your whatever it is, short feature, whatever. Uh, it might be hard for feature. You just could, you know, especially nine to five job is really hard. So you could, you know, I would say take a short and take that week, four to five days from your vacation time or that Friday, Saturday, Sunday to shoot your short film. And I just say, like, again, it, it, the nine to five job just, it definitely kills your spirit. But just, you know, you got to you just got to force yourself, you know, go to sleep at nine o'clock. Hey, you know what? Let me get two hours of writing, 10 to 11. Go to sleep at 11 o'clock, whatever. And again, again, it's not easy because, again, I've been there. I've been there when I got straight home and I'm full asleep. Hey, even at work, try to cheat your way of trying to write some uh, half an hour writing something. You could try to slip that in there. Lunchtime, you could try to slip it in there. Something, try to slip it somewhere. Some ideas, write an outline or something. Or if you have a lot of time in your hands, Write your story and hire somebody to help you write the story. And then that's, 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 that's my, you know, that's my whole, um, you know, um, suggestion that I would give, because again, it is really hard, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, um, that's, that's what I would say, you know, you know, but that's the only thing you can do when you have that nine to five, you know, this is, it's tiring. You have a nine to five job. It's really tiring. You know, especially if you have family and kids and responsibilities and everything like that. And yeah, get a team also. Get 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 three people that you really trust. You know, um, you know, get a a you, the person that helps gonna help you write. Get maybe the person who's gonna act to know you know ideas bounce back and forth. And your DP, you know, get get those guys around you to support you and give you that. Okay, let's. This is what we're gonna do. This we're gonna do because you can't do everything yourself. You know, that's the thing. You know, yeah, independent, you take a lot of responsibility. You take a lot of the whole thing. It's a lot of hats you have to wear, but you do need, you do need help. They've got the idea. They've got the script. 
but they don't know where to go from there. Like, are there any resources you have found that helped you? Are there any resources you'd point people to, to really kind of make that next step into like actually starting to film and, or maybe, maybe like option the script to somebody, like, where would you point them to for that? As in what, like when you're shooting something or you want to sell your script, let's just say, let's say to, to shoot something, you know, let, let's say like, I mean, how they, you they, know it's there. I would say, give it to people, to, you know, your friends to read it out to say it makes sense. I mean, there's a couple of ways you can do, you can, like if you really, really, really want to like f- feel it out, like an industry sort of thing, you know, you could get it to a script doctor and a script doctor will like analyze it and tell you what they think it's missing. And this is sort of like more industry standards, like the industry way of like, OK, I'm going to analyze your film. I'm going to give it a score and I'm going to tell you what's wrong with your film, what your film compares to what film and what are you looking at? You can get that. You know, they can, some some script doctors, 150 to 300 dollars. You send it to them. And they'll tell you what they think. Remember the day where they think it's wrong, what you need to add, what you think is missing. You could take that information and say, okay, run with it. I think it is a pretty cool tool, but sometimes it could be very uh, discouraging. I've had a lot of friends that did it and the notes came back like basically saying redo and it could be discouraging. Maybe you want to take those notes literally and you want to redo it or you just want to do your vision, just do the way you want to do it. I mean, that's one way. Give it to somebody who writes scripts and knows about scripts and everything like that and write it. But I really do think it's a good idea to give it to a script doctor. Don't spend more than $150. You definitely could find somebody, maybe max 200 But if this is what you really love, spend the money. And I, I think that, you know, they have them a lot. You'll go online, script doctors, and they'll analyze your film. They'll tell you what's wrong with your film. I, I know a lot of these places also try to, like, trick you, like, oh, we could write it for you. Don't go there. Just say, look, go find one that you just want just to analyze the film, script doctor, look at it, see what they think about it in, in Hollywood standards, where would it stand in Hollywood industry, you know? So, you know, if film scripts rarely get eights, you know, this like, you know, a big top films in Hollywood get eights. Those are considered like, oh, those are the ones, you know, no one really gets yeah. a 10. So, you know, so it's a, you know, you're looking around maybe a f- five, six, you know, that's, that's, you know, whatever it's standard seven, whatever, whatever standards are now. I, or I stopped paying attention to that after a while because I'm like started to say, you know, I'm, I am very kind of an unconventional filmmaker. So I know the stuff that I'm going to write. They're going to come back and say, no. <laughs> so, again, I think it's really good to go to the script doctors and see what they say. You submit it. They'll give it back to you in three weeks, maybe shorter time. If they got no work. And I think it's a pretty good idea. And um, yeah. It's it's interesting you mentioned the fives and the sixes. I, I don't know if Harrison ever told you this story. And I want to make sure I do this story justice. There was a story he told. Um, about getting to sit down with um, Sid Haig. And uh, he, he, the time he had with Sid Haig, he tried to learn everything from him he possibly can, he possibly could. And one of the things Sid Haig had talked about, like when you're getting like your reviews, um, I thought this was interesting. He said, you want a stack of your eights, nines, tens, but he said, you also want a stack of like your fives and your sixes. He said, what you don't ever want to see is a stacks of like ones, twos, and threes. And he said, the reason for that is if you get a one or two or a three, there, that's basically these people saying that the film had no impact on you. But if you have a five or a six, yeah, it's not the highest score, but your film still had an impact on them. So he said, you actually still really do want to see your fives and your sixes in addition to your eights and your nines and your tens, because that at least tells you that your film did enough to impact this person, even if they didn't like it. So it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. You say that. So in, in that vein too, I guess, you know, my, my last question to you about, about like your advice to, to new filmmakers, what are some things they should look out for? Like they've got the script, they they've done the shooting. Let's say they actually want to distribute. Are there some pitfalls you would say to look out for that? A lot of new filmmakers. Make? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go back to one more thing. Go buy a very reputable book about writing screenplays. That okay. I really highly recommend because if you read uh, one of these, those books, rep, you know, respectable books out there, it definitely tells you how to write a script. And there's a formula for all scripts. OK, even the most unconventional script writer, Quentin Tarantino, they all formula. OK, they all have it, you know, first 10 minutes has to apply to the last 10 minutes of the film. First plot point has to be under 15 minutes, nothing over 15 minutes. You look at movies when you take this sort of like 
you know, you read this literature that you read and you apply it to what you watch, you see things different. So that you read this book, you read the screenplays, and it tells you where these plot points in every single movie is, mostly all of them. And you start to watch movies, you start to say, holy shit, that book was right. I saw the first plot point in the first 15 minutes. I saw, oh my God, the first 10 minutes of the film is the last 10 minutes of the film. Not every single movie, but almost every single movie takes that same formula of screenwriting. So read it and then look at films and you're going to see exactly what that that book meant, what it was talking about screenwriting. Like, oh, shit, every film is the same exactly damn film. It's just a different story, but it's the same formula that the plot points throughout the movie in the same exactly timeline, depending on how long from a 90 minute film to a two hour film right please do that that's what i tell a lot of a lot of you guys that that's what i miss to say please read at least one book okay not all of us is francis <laughs> <laughs> so there, 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 yeah, the reason I, we're laughing audience sorry Hill, let me let me let me tell you real quick the reason the real alpha he was telling me a story about francis ford coppola that he made that he made the godfather and um he decided after the film that he wanted to uh, learn how to write a script, and he, he picked up a book. And the first line of the book says, "Watch the Godfather." <laughs> that's why that's why we're laughing because that's, that's yeah. something that came up in yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's a god. I mean, you know. But yeah, so the last question you asked me: What is the pitfalls of looking out for as in screenwriting? Yeah, just just in filmmaking in general. You know, like the person that that's doing what you did with zombie with a shotgun stuff, they they've written the script They're they're, they're filming and maybe they're, they're lucky enough to get uh, you know, they're going after, they're going after financing. What are some things I've heard that the film industry could be kind of predatory, especially with like distribution and things like that. Are there just kind of some things that every new filmmaker should look out for? Yeah. Don't sign on the first deal you get because you can do it yourself. Now distribution, not back as I was in the, in the eighties, nineties, two thousands. Now you could actually self distribute your film. Um, there's so many different sites now that you can upload your film and you basically are uh, able to tell the distribution I'm out and you could be out under the contract. Uh, distribution has been a little bit different now these days because then now they know about these new sort of like places that you can go. Filmhub.com is one of the places that you guys can do, put there, put your films there and distribute through that site. It's uh, it's there's no. Uh, um, there's nothing that says you're locked into this much years. Anytime you want out of the deal, you just delete your project, gone, boom. Okay. And then you could, you could, and that site, you can see how much money you make, how much films, how, where the, how many t- places is being played, how many times is being played. It shows you a whole rundown, not just Film Hub. There's many other places, but I'm just telling you, Film Hub is a really good one to start off with when you want to distribute your own project. And they're going to do the same thing they go that a distribution company is going to do. Now, I say this about indie filmmakers because if you, of course, if you have an actor, an A-list actor, B-list actor, this is a whole new ball game, right? We're talking about mm-hmm. indie filmmaking, right? You got your, you got these, you know, my actors that are friends or actors that are not known, they're not bankable, they're not going, you know. These are the places that you should go and distribute your own film. Because if you go to distributor, trust me, they're going to do the same exactly thing that these new websites are going to do, which is they're going to throw it through Amazon. They're going to throw it. They're going to try to sell it to Netflix. They're going to try to sell it to everyone. These companies actually are better than a lot of these distribution companies now. And believe it or not. And again, it's the same sort of deal they're giving. And if some of the deal is even better. You know, I think some of the some of these things are not 80, 20. You give 80, they get 20. Don't forget that the other companies such as like Amazon, they get also a percentage. But 80-20, that's never heard of back in the days. It was basically, yeah. you know, we're taking your film for a ride. Here's some, you know, you know, MGs, you know, minimum guarantee that there's no such thing as that anymore. You know what I mean? So don't go do your film and right away sign to somebody. Try. I, I'm telling you, if you have the time and everything, you could do it yourself. Again, go to filmhub.com you, or, or, or certain ones. I forgot the other names of the other ones, but you go through those people. But if you have that person, like I said, it's a whole different ball game. You go to you go look for searching for a distribution. They they will give you possibly, you know, you go to different territories because you know they, they, we're talking about territories and you know there's so many different territories you can sell your film to and everything. Especially when you have like A slash B list actors and each territory could be worth 
thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's why I say that's a whole different ball game when you start having them actors and probably you won't even that you don't have to do what I'm telling you to do. And you know, like I, I just would say, like you know, um, you know, number one key, and but everyone does, you know, don't put all your money in the production. Save some money for the post production. You know, you know, you you and we all do this mistake. We never learn. You know, it's like, don't drink. I'm never going to drink again. And you drink again. It's the same thing. Oh, I'm going to save money for post-production. We never do. When film is done, you got no money. So try to put the money aside for post-production. Very, very, very important. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's right now. That's the only things that's come up to me right now is in pitfalls and to, you know, don't don't um, don't get caught up on the camera. Don't get caught up. I'm going to shoot my film just the way they shoot at Netflix. I want the same exactly camera that they shot that film. Don't get caught up on that. Right now, all these cameras shoot so amazingly. I, you wouldn't even believe some of the stuff that I use in camera. People say, get to how I use that. I say, yep, I use that camera. You know, you get your DP, director of photography. They, they know exactly what to use the camera. Use, you can use the cameras that are out, you don't have to use the, you don't have to go out and get an Alexa camera. You know, you could get the cameras that are now are very good, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, get a good camera, but don't go crazy renting the, the, the professionals what they use. Because I'll tell you, the good cameras that are all out right now, the DSSRs from the Panasonics and the Sonys and the Canons that are out now, they're around $5,000. You know, you could buy one of them or you could rent them and they shoot as well as these big studio cameras trust me i'll tell you i've seen it so many times that i couldn't even believe it so don't get caught up in that we need to get that camera we need to get that look right netflix is not going to buy your film trust me because they have an in-house production now only if your shit is like the most amazing talked about in every single radio station network in the whole wide world they're gonna buy it other than that they already got their in-house films. They make they it's 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 a, it's like a it's a factory. That's why every single film that comes out from them looks the same. Same damn production company is going to the next film, to the next country, the next country. And that's why everything looks the same. But you don't want that. You want to you know you want to stand out. I think that's that's about it. That's great stuff. That's that's great stuff, man. I I really I got to tell you I, I'm walking away from this. I feel so blessed to have gotten to talk to you because I mean it's it's one thing to get to to watch amazing work. But then to actually get to sit and, and spend time with the person that produced it and kind of dive into their mind and the way they think about things. And they say, I, I just feel so blessed. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on my show. It, it really has been a privilege and honor, Hilton. It really has. And I, I absolutely want to have you back on again in the future for sure. Oh, that's awesome, man. I really appreciate the kind words, man. Thank you for having me. And, and thank you for, uh, you know, um, giving my, you know, my take on uh, my experiences. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Where, uh, uh, j- just to wrap it up, where, where can people find you? What, uh, what, what social medias are you available on? Yeah, I'm in, I'm on every single social media, but the one that you can find me and you can like hit me a message on a daily basis on Twitter. I have two Twitter accounts that is very like busy. I do on a daily basis. I'm on, which is my full name, which is Hilton area Ruiz, one complete word. And then you could hit me at zombie W a shotgun. That's also Twitter. And you could hit me up in a message. You could follow me. I'll follow you back. If I don't follow you back, give me give me a couple of days. I eventually will follow. I'm not that guy that won't follow you. And if I didn't follow you, it's because I might have missed you. But I follow everyone that follows me back. I'm not that guy. That, I'm not gonna follow nobody because you know the fans are the ones that support me the most. I'm gonna follow everybody back. And you can ask me anything you want to ask. I will respond. It may take a day or two, but I will respond. And again, if I miss you, hit me up again. I must have missed it because you do miss. You know how it is. You it, Twitter, you can miss the the message. Oh, yeah. It'll be all the way because I get like, you know, I make 15, 20 messages a day. I'm, I could miss it. Like, oh, wow. I forgot. I didn't see that. I thought it was spam, blah, blah, blah. And I'm also on Instagram, Zombie with a Shotgun. Um, I'm, um, and Hilton I is also in, in Instagram. Yeah. Those are the, those are the places that you could hit me up that I'm always on all the time. Um, yeah. Facebook. I'm not really on it. Even though I have a, a Zion with Shotgun page, I'm more busier on, in a daily basis on Twitter and on Instagram. And also I have my YouTube page. You can, you know, you can go see all my stuff there and they're all usually YouTube slash Hilton and Ruiz or YouTube slash zombie, but a shotgun and on and on with every other social media uh, platform. Awesome. Thank you so much again for being on the podcast and uh, man, you're, you're amazing. I appreciate it. Oh man. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate that. Yes, sir.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. I hope you had a lot of fun. I just want to take a quick moment to remind each and every one of you that you're loved, that you matter, and I'm so glad each and every one of you are here. So until next time, stay curious, stay tuned, and as George Miro used to always say, stay scared. <laughs>